天意起无缝，匠心简洁沉，浑然归一体，广随妙绝伦，造化爱几何，四力现为人。千古寸心事，欧高李嘉诚。Chern liked this poem, but he said the last line put him together with the Euclid, Gauss, uh, Riemann, and Cartan. It's a Young's line, but I think uh, he deserves to be there because he revitalized differential geometry. He created a branch of mathematics which now unites all the major branches of mathematics with rich structure, which is still developing today. He gave you a feeling of weight. He was there and you had to notice him. He exuded a strange kind of majesty of some, some, some sort of... You, you, you knew you were in the scent of things if you knew him. I think he was a very happy man. He said he was a Mandarin, so he wasn't trained to do anything. He said it was really a good thing that, that he found mathematics, otherwise he, he, he doesn't know what he would have done. I went to mathematics uh, gradually and automatically. No decision. Chern was a gentleman, a brilliant mathematician who opened up new fields of mathematics and set the stage for a huge development in geometry in the latter part of the 20th century. You can look back and see many strands in the mathematical world today that had their origins and things that Chern was involved in. Professor Chern was different of geometry. He brought up the whole field for about 20, 30 years. Chern is not a general problem solver. He concentrates on one area and dug deep in that and produced profound new mathematics. Chern was one of those people who really did see down to the foundations and really understood what was important. I was born in a small town and there was uncertainty about the situation. So I left as a small baby to the countryside. Professor Chen was born in 1911. That was the year that modern China was born. We overthrew the Manchu dynasty in 1911. My father was in a legal profession, and he went away for his work. Occasionally, he came back during the holidays, and he taught me some mathematics. Very early on, he managed to get a hold of some math textbooks and found that it was very easy for him and very interesting for him. I happened to pick up some mathematics, which was useful when I took part in these competitive examinations in order to enter certain schools. His family then moved to Tianjin, to this city, and when he was quite young. And then he joined the, the Fulun Middle School. He always talked about independence. When he was in high school, he wrote a little poem. It's printed in the school newspaper on flying a kite. And usually people really admire the fact that the kite can fly high above the ground, enjoying all this great view of the earth. But he put it a different way. He said, I really have really have You are flying so high, and yet you do not have freedom. All your freedom, all is determined by that little stream. I feel sad for you. You can see when he was very young, he already has that kind of independent thinking. After he finished the middle school, he got into the Nankai University and got his the bachelor degree here. When he went to Nankai, he was only 15. Nankai University he just started. It had very few students but it was modeled after the American system. The lab required that you blow up a few glass balls, which he wasn't able to do. 
But I was clumsy with experiments, so naturally I took more and more mathematics. 1930, Chern came to Tsinghua as a graduate student. He was the only graduate student in the math department, so therefore the university decided to convert him into an assistant. My father was one of the few professors of mathematics. Chern sometimes came to see my father in our house. My father told me that he was a brilliant student. Chen Xian sometimes said, in the Chen he first really made contact with Westerners when Blaschke came to give some lectures in China. I think that was in 32. Chern was 21 years old. He was so impressed by Blaschke. Blaschke was very good in teaching. Yeah? He was a very vivid personality. Yeah? And he could convince his audience that mathematics is something very, very interesting. He gave lectures on web geometry. I even took some notes of his lectures. So when I had the, my fellowship to study also China, I chose Hamburg. He went to Hamburg, where Blaschke was, and studied web geometry. And, and it was his first real experience traveling outside of China. And he sort of saw the world on his way to Germany. My relation with Blaschke was very close. When I first saw him, he started by giving me a bunch of his uh, latest reference, mostly on web geometry. I studied them. I discovered a gap in one of his proofs. So he was very glad. A new student from China was able to detect something essential. And Blaschka says, oh, well, that's very interesting. Well, if you can correct that mistake, then that's your thesis. And he wrote a beautiful dissertation. It has these amazing diagrams. They're very geometric. And they show this wonderful early insight that Chern had that married very complicated calculations with just being able to see what was true. His other main teacher was Artin. And he got um, a very intimate friend with Erich Keller. Erich Keller was a young man like Chern himself. These two became friends between 34 and 36, and there was a very close relationship between the two of them, and also, I think, in getting along with mathematics. From Keller, Chern learned about uh, the moving frame method, and that made his decision after Hamburg to go to Paris. After Blaschke, then he went several months to Paris, to He'd studied with Elie Cartan, who was arguably the leading geometer of certainly the first half of the 20th century. Cartan was developing some new views about differential geometry. Chern was the one who really absorbed the subtle points of Cartan's ideas. The first time I saw Elie Cartan, he gave me a problem. And uh, naturally, I couldn't do it. Then after probably three, four months, he told me that I could see him at, uh, in his apartment. They would talk, and then Sherman would go home, and the next day, he'd get a letter from Cartan saying, here's what I think we were talking about, and here's what I think about this subject, and why it's important. After this year, I found Cartan not difficult to read. I was able to think more or less in the same way he did. Notation can play a very important role. And in differential geometry, there were notation wars for many years. And then in the 1920s, Cartan invented a new notation called moving frames. And when Chern studied with Cartan, he became an expert. Chern was the translator for many of us to this obscure way of, of Elie Cartan of doing things. And 
he made it very transparent for us. Chern guided me into reading papers that Carton had written. Uh, they were very difficult to understand, and Chern explained it in very simple terms. It was very elegant. Uh, Carton invented a, a moving frame method, but Chern really was the one who used it to solve global problems, PDE problems, and his characteristic class also, if you use moving frame, it becomes very beautiful and simple and natural. The original idea of moving frames was very old. In trying to understand the geometry of a curve in space, you attach to the curve at each point. First, you attach its velocity vector, that is, the tangent along the curve, and then the acceleration, which is the direction the curve is turning. And then the third direction tells you which direction the curve is twisting. Attaching this apparatus, this three directions to each point of the curve, and thereby framing what the curve is doing. One, you know, a different frame at each point along the curve is where the idea of moving frame came from. But that idea turns out also to be very useful for surfaces. The beauty of the method is that then you can concentrate on how the frame is rotating as you move. And that turns out to read off all kinds of, of useful information about the surface. Well, that simple idea for curves and surfaces in three space actually generalizes to higher dimensional things in higher dimensional spaces. Start with moving frames, write down differential forms, take D of the forms, write them in terms of other forms, take D of those forms, and in the end you wind up with geometric invariance. It's just, it's a miracle. Then in 1937, he was ready to come back to China. That was the first year of the Sino-Japanese War. For safety, they had moved the Beijing University to Kunming in southwest China. So Chern went to Kunming to help get the university going. Kunming is famous during the Second World War as the end of the Burma Road. During Japanese occupation of coastal China, China had no communication with the outside world, except through a road which ended in Kunming, the other end being in Burma. That was the road on which American gasoline was shipped into China. He started to build up first uh, the Mathematical Institute of the Chinese Academy of Science. So that was the first foundation of a research institution. He gave up to 16 hours a week lectures to graduate students. I had audited a few courses from Chern, and I think I took one course from him uh, called uh, Differential Geometry. It was in Kunming where he did a lot of his work, a lot of his early work on applying Carton's method of equivalence. It was there that he met Xining and married her. Chern's marriage with uh, Mrs. Chen was in some sense introduced by my parents. Uh, it was obvious during the Kunming time that here's this young, uh, brilliant uh, professor, Chern, and the daughter of one of my father's colleagues. He didn't know Chen Yuan. He was very happy to go to Kunming to get married. 跑了以后呢，在昆明这个条件比较差，不能做双人床啊等等，所以结了婚以后呢，陈师母就回到上海。My mother went to Shanghai so that I could be born in a better medical facility, and that's why. I did not see my father for six years. And then Kunming was in danger. So the American army got him out over the Burma Road, and he made his way to the United States, here to the Institute. He went to America from Kunming through a very circuitous route. He took some American military plane maybe a DC-3.
He entered the United States right at the beginning of 1943 in Miami and then took a train up to the Institute for Advanced Study. The main person of contact at the Institute at that time was probably Hermann Weil. Hermann Weil had tried to understand Cartan at one point, and he gave up, but Chern could explain it. Chern did two very important pieces of work during his period at the Institute for Advanced Study. The first one was his proof of the Gauss-Binet theorem, which relates the bending or curvature of a surface to its global topological properties, how many holes it has in it, if you think of a surface as being like a donut with many holes. If you compute the curvature at every point and go over the entire surface, you're only seeing these small bits. But if you average all those small bits, you will be able to tell how many holes there are in the surface. That's pretty striking. It took some time for the complex characteristic classes to be useful yeah, uh, much longer. But the proof of Gauss Bonnet, uh, I was very happy with it. The title of the paper is A Simple Intrinsic Proof of the Gauss Bonnet Theorem. That led to Turing classes, the fundamental characteristic classes in geometry, in topology, in algebraic geometry. It's impossible to conceive of differential geometry without, without Chern classes, so I would think that that would be regarded as his most important contribution. The introduction of characteristic classes played a major role in the latter part of the 20th century. These classes are called Chern classes. They occur in, all over the mathematical literature. So the churn class, it's uh, an invariant which will distinguish different kinds of twisting. We've got a manifold of some sort, like a circle, or a surface, like a sphere, or the boundary of an inner tube, and then there's higher dimensional manifolds. So these things occur in all dimensions. So over a circle, the simplest bundle is where you just take one stalk of grain at each point in the circle and it goes around. Each point in the circle has a vertical line and it doesn't twist. However, it could be that you put a twist in it like this, and now you have a Mobius strip, and there's, the vertical lines are still there in this Mobius strip. However, as we, as we go around the circle, the vertical lines go like this, and then they turn over and, come, and glue up like that. So that's a non-trivial bundle because of this twisting in it. Well, that kind of twisting can occur in all dimensions because bundles can be more than just one dimensional. They can be a plane or something higher dimensional, and they can occur over higher dimensional manifolds so it could get very complicated. It was such an important idea. It was so original and, and foundational that people studied it so much that it became part of the way we think. It's impressive that churn classes are there. They're still there. Churn's methods, transgression, connections and all are still there and they're used all the time. From Princeton, I went back in 1946 and that was immediately after the end of the, of the war. He was entrusted with the creation of the Mathematics Institute in the Academia Sinica. China at that point did not have enough good mathematicians. He was the institute founder and director. He was its only professor, and he taught them topology from morning till dusk. The most important thing is to train young people. So I wrote to all the important departments in China, asking him to recommend the best student in the last few years. And they all came. He actually recruited, if I remember correctly, 12 students. He lectured them directly, personally, every day. And these 12 students later on all became very famous.
，所以我们也很容易自由的谈论起来。It was a period of terrible unrest in China after the war, and things got worse and worse, and more and more chancy. Then the communist government was taking over. At the end of 1948, Churn was invited by Oppenheimer this time, at the urging of uh, Herman Weyer, to come to visit Princeton. And his response was, I will do it only if my family comes also. The Institute was a savior from that standpoint. They were willing to bring us to the United States. January 1949, they came to the United States again. They went to the Institute in Princeton. They stayed there for about a half a year. Then the University of Chicago invited him to become a professor. They arrived in the summer of 49 and moved into a faculty apartment. Chicago is very intense. Chicago is the center of science in the world when he was there. It was a golden period, and he became a leading figure in mathematics. I had heard about this strange new course that people were very excited with given by S.S. Chern, and it was totally different from anything else which I'd ever heard. His notes from that course became the basis of present-day differential geometry throughout the world. Life was good, but Chicago is very cold and very windy in the winter. We came to California in March of 59. It was a very easy move. He came to Berkeley as a new star. In a very short period of time, he had a great department in differential geometry. The group in geometry under Chern's leadership grew and grew and uh, was world famous. Chern was, of course, one of the reasons to go to Berkeley to study differential geometry. He was a teacher. He didn't try to explain everything so that there was nothing for you to do, but he taught you to see the importance and beauty of things. He did go out of his way to relate to young, the young generation. Now that, that is a rare quality. Not many women in mathematics, so I, when I first met him, I feel very comfortable. He didn't treat me differently as if I'm a woman. He sort of tried to give me confidence, say it's okay, just work. Whenever你每当有一些数学方面的问题疑难去问他的话，他往往就是说几句话就可以让你感让你就是说可以引入告诉你应该怎么做，应该怎么。他并不是一个具体的问题的具体的步骤，但是他的一个很深刻的观察可
I really believe that all the good things that happened in my life since then were due to the efforts of one individual who helped me get into the department, and I wanted to name the chair after him. It's Professor Chern. I realized how important Chern had been in my life. So I decided that I wanted to do something really special for Chern. We now have a Chern visiting professorship in the department that was funded by the donation of Robert and his wife, Louise Bidwell. You know, a young mathematician would show up in Berkeley, and typically, Chern would immediately take him out to lunch. It's this young person, like he did me. You know, I was a grad student, and here this guy took me out to lunch. You know, <laughs> and that's the way he was. We went to this small Chinese restaurant on the edge of campus, and the food was incredibly good. It was the most amazing Chinese food I'd ever eaten in my life. I was completely bowled over because, you know, here I was nobody, and here this great mathematician was spending time with me, even bothered to take me out to lunch. I found out later that the best Chinese restaurant in Berkeley at any given time is the restaurant that Churn is eating at. Because somehow or another, the cooks know when Churn is there, and they would always make it extra special for him. Churn took us out to a Chinese meal, and <laughs> it was an unbelievable scene when the, uh, the proprietor of this restaurant saw Churn. I don't know how he knew Churn's fame, but literally rolled out the red carpet, and, uh, and he was treated like a king. <laughs> Uh His routine was it was to get up, have a cup of tea, do his math, have another cup of tea. Don't do his math, have lunch, take a nap, have a cup of tea, and do his math. So there was, there was no exercise in that whole routine. <laughs> he did his mathematics, he went to the office, and my mother pretty much managed everything else. Mrs. Chen became the most gracious American hostess you can imagine. And she would have big parties serving typical American food. She took care of all the daily necessities so that he could be free to only think about mathematics. They were very close. They only need to kind of see each other. They can see from each other's eyesight to see what they, the other want. They are very lucky to have such a good marriage. Somebody presented a, a problem to all these mathematicians, and it turned out that my mother was the one who actually solved it first. In certain ways, she gave up some things in order to help him out. She did not pursue some of her own interests, but she was just a very traditional person. And I think, um, very nice person. When the idea for MSRI was born in the 70s, it was very important that Chern would be the first director. And the committee that really got MSRI going was Chern and Singer and Calvin Moore. Chern was, in a sense, Berkeley's most distinguished professor. Whenever we had to go to the chancellor to make some special request, we always took Chern along, and it always worked. Somehow he had a presence, a gravitas. He, there was something about him that People just listened to him and uh, usually did things his way. He was a man of firm convictions who believed that things should go a certain way, and yet he was very subtle about advancing these ideas. Cal and I convinced Chern that he should be the director. of. He's the one who made MSRI an instant success by virtue of his making phone calls and inviting people to come. I think it's all indirect somehow. See, I, uh, I never want to do anything. Yeah. I 
told Charon that he didn't have to do anything. All he had to do was be there. Charon wanted MSRI to be a place that would be free of distractions, where mathematicians with common interests could come together and think deeply about the problems that they were working on. Charon had a wonderful office there, the rector's office. I once visited when Charon was there for part of the time, then this office was given to me. And I was sitting there and overlooking the bay of San Francisco and thinking about Chern and his influence. After the establishment of the People's Republic of China, the latter went through a period of isolation, and isolation became even more perverse during the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976. You wouldn't even dream of getting a foreign journal. This is a very, very bad period in Chinese history. In 因为那时候所谓的红卫兵运动 Sulian 陈 and I and many others felt that we have the responsibility to try to create a more understanding between the American people and the Chinese people. And B, we feel that we should uh, try to help China to uh, acquire more modern scientific knowledge. All of us share the desire to promote more exchanges I was with Chern out in Berkeley during one of our collaborative sessions, and he said to me, Yang might go to China. Now, at that time, no one had gone to China. That is, no Americans had gone to China. I said, really? What do you mean? He said, well, maybe Yang will go to China. I said, OK. Andre Vey, whose collaboration with Chern had gone way back, decided to use this Tang Dynasty sculpture of a horse as the frontispiece for his book. Chern did a calligraphy to accompany it. This says, the old horse knows the way. Professor Chen set up a bridge between mathematicians of China and America and Europe. 一开始，大量的工作差不多十年以上的时间，他是在两边跑。跑的目的就是给中国的青年人创造一个机会，让大家更有机会接触到国际的数学界。
也把国际事业界大量的人引进来，也把很多人派出去，来实现交流，通过交流来提高水平。Chern was one of the people that that really was able to get a lot of Western mathematicians to go and visit China. Chern had the stature that he said, "This is important. Invite these people." And it wasn't so easy. 国内有些人，也包括一些呃，在海外的一些人，就说。呃，有人批评，说这是呃卖国求荣，说我们中国教授怎么就不行，怎么非要请国外的教授呢？就有人提出这样的问题，呃，这种话呢，在当时来讲，在文革刚结束不久，还是有它的市场的，所以当时也给陈先生造成一定的压力。At that time, we didn't have many established mathematician to come to give lectures. So if there was a lecture by famous mathematician, of course we all went there, even though we didn't understand what he was talking about. Chern convinced the Chinese government that it was in their interest to finance the studies of Chinese mathematicians abroad. He, probably more than anybody, was responsible for the great waves of Chinese mathematicians who came to the United States first as students. Many of them stayed in the United States and also in, in Europe and have had a tremendous influence on mathematics around the world. He was sending Chinese students to Humboldt, to Berlin. So he tried to use his context uh, to send young uh, students somewhere else. And that's pretty much the real beginning of uh, international exchange between China and other and, and the rest of the world. Now, if we meet anyone who got uh, nice positions in the United States or in European countries in mathematical field, he may answer you. He got help from Professor Chen. Then his thought process was, so how do we get mathematicians who are of very good quality and can stay in the West to actually go back to China? Many Chinese who got their training here, had their opportunities here, and were very successful here, have gone back to China or Hong Kong uh, with a new career. So there is a sense of coming home. In 1979年吧,我特別到Berkeley去 Professor Chan has the vision to really set up an institute inside the mainland of China so that more young people can get educated. So indeed, in 1986, Chen established this institute in Nankai. In the process of uh, establishment of the Nankai Institute of Mathematics, now it's called the Chen Institute of Mathematics, Professor Chen and Professor Hu get much help from the high-ranked officers in Chinese government, including Mr. Deng, Mr. Jiang, and also some other ministers. They regarded Chen as an equal, at least in academic matters. If Chen thinks so, it must be worthy of support. The International Congress was held in Beijing in 2002. Chern was the architect of the Chinese application. Jiang Zemin committed to having the uh, opening ceremony in the Great Hall of the People. 
Chern had the stature to mobilize the Chinese government to do this. Uh After his retirement, he was shuttling between China and Berkeley for about 20 years. And then in 1999, he decided to move back to China permanently. I don't think it was anything to be considered whether or not he would go back. It's obvious that he would go back. Bushikwanguikunga,而且是的这个地方,这个整个的这个土大大的茂生啊,他到中国来,是为祖国中国的数学,整个的这个,他不光是光为南开大学。所以,好歹有一句话,这个字叫做立足南开, Stand on Nankai, Mianxian Chenko, Fangye Sijie. In our institute, staffs, professors are very nice to each other. So this is the important lesson of Professor Chen. There's a question of what is his style of management institute. And there is a classical Chinese term for Chinese characters called wu wei er zhi, govern without doing anything. Chen really believed Lao Tzu's philosophy, and uh, he applied to the way he handled administration. He said, my policy to operate this institute is very simple. Three words in Chinese. First, no meetings. Second, no plan. Third, do more. That means just do your research work. We have a free air of doing research. I think that is essentially influenced by Chen's philosophy of how to do research and how to do mathematics. Yang 也取了他名字当中一个字 因为他在美国的时候都是他夫人在管他的家里的事情 He said the Fields Medal was created in order to encourage young mathematicians. And then he paused and he said, but it's the old ones who need encouragement. 
Sturm was certainly well recognized in his career. He was a member of the National Academy. He got the National Medal of Science here. Obviously a member of the Chinese National Academy, a member of several foreign academies around the world. My father received the Shaw Prize in September of 2004, and it was the first time that the Shaw Prizes were awarded. The Shaw Prize is a million dollars, U.S. Of that million, it was all it was all donated. The Shaw Prize is usually given in September, and Paul said, "You know, why don't you do a prize in honor of your father?" The thought process was that a prize of $500,000 would be a nice amount of money and half would go to nonprofit organizations selected by the recipient to further mathematics. The Chern Medal was designed to honor lifetime achievement of a senior mathematician. The first Chern Medal was awarded in 2010 at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Hyderabad to Professor Louis Nirenberg from NYU. Chern said to me once, if you do one thing that's really good, that's all you can really expect in a lifetime. We marveled at Chern's ability to continue to produce interesting and deep mathematics throughout his career. And when I asked him about this, he replied that the trick is to have enough good ideas when you're young to last a lifetime. Chern, during his life, made very, very famous conjectures. And the conjectures influenced mathematics enormously. Yeah? Some conjectures were solved after three, four decades. Some are still open yeah? about curvature of submanifold of spheres. Yeah? Are very famous conjectures of Chern, still unsolved. Chern, even though he didn't always let on to it, knew that when he was doing computations, he was really doing computations on this higher space called the principal bundle. And this idea now just pervades geometry, and in particular, certain parts of geometry that are influential in physics. Why should the one equation which the mathematician cooked up already in the 19th century, which is a very beautiful uh, equation. Uh, why is that similar in structure with uh, the physicist's equation, which came from completely different uh, source? That's the mystery which nobody will be able to understand. I think, it's, uh, I think only God understands why that is so. There is the joke among physicists and mathematicians, why is it that physical laws are based on beautiful mathematics? Answer, because God is a mathematician, uh, which means that nobody understands this mystery. A few days before his death, Chen speaks about proving some important conjecture, more than 50 years old. We hear him discuss some idea of proving his theory. I should work up to my days, according to Chen's advice. Yeah.就是到了陈先生的晚年嘛，就是中国紫金山天文台发现了很多的小行星，那么有一颗星呢，他们决定用陈隐身的名字来命名。当时我们举行了一个仪式
I usually call him, you know, ordinary great man. Because usually people like to say it's extraordinary people, unusual people. I consider him as a very usual person, but great. He encouraged you to do things which may not be the norm, but he was looking out into the distant future. His sight was further than most other people. He was a very reflective person. It's a different kind of approach to doing things. There's a lot of ways to get there. I'll take my time. There's a quotation from Lao Tzu, uh, an ancient Chinese philosopher that could have been written about Chern. The master does his job and then stops. He understands that the universe is forever out of control and that trying to dominate events goes against the current of the Tao. Because he believes in himself, he doesn't try to convince others. Because he is content with himself, he doesn't need others' approval. Because he accepts himself, the whole world accepts him. <laughs> 